my favorite show uh, ideas. So without further ado, <laughs> just gonna jump into it. For the presentations, do we um, um so can you uh, during the I don't know how it was done uh, previously, but when we have finished with the presentations, put also the on the on the screen whatever it is uh, on people online. So like that, we have a, a clear idea of the uh, of the questions. Yeah, thank you. Let me. I was thinking not the Polish name. <laughs> I wanted to see the Polish uh, <laughs> um This works very well. So we can start. Yes. Uh, do you all know who I am? Yes. Good. I'm uh, Ana Maria Dobre. I'm one of the working at the DG Regio, yeah, at the European Commission, and one of the organizers of uh, of this event. And for those um, who were present uh, yesterday evening, um, you could uh, you could I some of the faces I know, some of the names I know. So what I what would be really interesting and, and important when um, uh, wanting to intervene in the session and asking questions, it would be also to introduce yourself first and then to, uh, to proceed. I would say that we will, um, in order to ensure a little bit the, um, um, uh, the, to keep the, with the timeline, but also to make sure that colleagues have um, a fair share of time when, uh, when presenting, uh, because always the last ones are those that are suffering the most waiting and having the last 10 minutes instead of, uh, you know, like full uh, presentation time and, and, and follow up question. I would say that maybe we can, um, and also for the sake of uh, uh, not getting bored with the same method all over and over again, to go with the first two presentations and then round of uh, questions and answers, and then we'll go to the last two presentations. Yes, and then at the end, if we still have a little bit of time, we're going to have to, you know, like to round up uh, uh, questions. So um, we'll start, first of all, with the first presentation, and that is uh, Mr. Pramit Verma and uh, colleagues, am I correct? Yes, yes. And uh, colleagues uh, from the different uh, Polish uh, universities. And uh, your uh, title, the title of your paper that you're going to present today is Local Mindset in Times of um, a Global Climate Crisis. And if it's possible to already put the first, uh, you, you do have a, yes. a power. Yes. It's this one. Yes. And I add uh, just the green button. That's excellent. Green, go ahead. Um, so um, I'm just going to offer you the possibility you either want to take a chair and you can sit here or here it's very flexible depending on so please so a very good afternoon to uh, everyone my name is Pramit uh, I am from Nicholas Copernicus University in Poland and uh, this is a presentation of the work we have been doing for, uh, like, this is the first part of the work we have been doing in Poland. And this is along with my colleagues. It is titled Local Mindset in Times of Global Climate Crisis, a study from urban low carbon strategies in Central Europe, Poland. So as we all know that uh, energy consumption and production has increased many folds uh, in the current times. And uh, energy is needed for economic development, for social well-being, for strategic security. But it, it also has a lot of impact in terms of uh, climate change. And uh, I guess that most of us must have heard this news that uh, 
uh, one third of the glaciers are now going to uh, disappear by 2050. So this is one of the impacts of uh, energy consumption. And that is why there's a need to create sustainable or renewable energy strategies in uh, urban areas. So I say urban areas because urbanization is responsible for a lot of mobilization of resources and responsible for a lot of activities which directly and indirectly contribute to uh, energy emissions. Now, uh, I had prepared something to justify that uh, uh, why geographic areas with different kind of histories and different kind of uh, uh, policies are important for studies, but uh, it was already taken up in the plenary session, if we all remember, that why uh, place-based policies are needed in the current times. So uh, that is why if we see at the uh, Europe or the European Union, we see that there are many countries at different levels of, uh, uh, of energy emissions or resource consumption or uh, uh, different kind of patterns of policies that we see. And so, so. I forgot to change the slide. Yeah, so uh, for example, in Poland, we see that uh, uh, about uh, a lot of, there's a lot of dependence on coal-based energy systems. And uh, about 40% of the energy comes from coal-based energy systems. Of course, it has been able to reduce its uh, uh, dependence on solid biomass-based fuels, but still it is there to some extent. And then we see that because of uh, certain uh, global challenges like, uh, and the COVID-19 pandemic, which we had, and uh, the current uh, war in Ukraine, which is uh, a, 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 a having a lot of impact on the global energy uh, consumption patterns. We see that because of this, there's a need to understand the different factors or dimensions which work in energy policies, in energy, energy transition, uh, uh, for energy transition processes. So that is why uh, the basic hypothesis for my work was to understand that how urban areas uh, can contribute to local sustainability because they have their own different characteristics and uh, with the appropriate policies they can contribute to local sustainability which is quite important at the present time and this in this we had uh, two major objectives first one was to analyze the challenges and opportunities for a low carbon uh, economy in the polish context and then to assess the energy transition modes, that is the uh, basic focus of the energy transition policies in Poland, and uh, understand how they can be uh, enhanced. So uh, Poland is actually uh, quite similar to, uh, it has certain uniquenesses, but it, it is similar to Central and Eastern European countries. And it has a lot, uh, large uh, uh, coal-based uh, energy in, in industry, so that, that is why it is quite important in this way. And so the methodology for this included uh, three major aspects. One, first one was the bibliometric analysis using the R package bibliometrics in uh, uh, for literature from 2010 to 2022. The other two components included quantitative and qualitative analysis of the current state of uh, activities in energy transition and the current uh, uh, energy transition plans in different kind of uh, uh, Polish cities. So these two were combined together in order to understand what is the direction of different kind of uh, energy transition policies in Poland. So this is the basic overview of the results, which I will be explaining soon. Uh, now, this is the result of the bibliometric analysis in the on the right side. You can see that uh, this is the keyword co-occurrence plot, which shows different kind of focus areas of uh, energy transition research in Poland. And uh, the different colors represent different clusters or the different thematic areas which are closely present together. The distance between different clusters also represent the, the correlatedness between different uh, uh, focus areas. So, and similar thing is represented on the second plot also. So I would not go into the detail of the second plot because the different quadrants here represent certain kind of characteristics. But what I want to highlight here is the cluster, the yellow colored cluster on the, uh, right hand top side corner, which represents participation, politics, leadership, and legitimacy. So this was a quite isolated cluster in Poland. And it represents that there was very uh, challenge in integrating the aspects related with politics with the participation or perception of energy policies in, uh, in the uh, energy uh, uh, transition context. And a similar thing was observed in the leadership cluster, which was in the uh, in the fourth quadrant, which is the which represents the emerging themes, 
So based on this, uh, on the literature review, we were, we were able to classify the different challenges and opportunities into six major themes, which were related with social, economic, institutional, political, and so on. So uh, this is not an exhaustive list, list of the challenges which we identified, but uh, this just uh, this is a summary of the challenges. For example, in the uh, economic dimension, the current energy market and carbon finance is a major challenge for Poland because it is estimated that the coal-based industry will become unsustainable and unprofitable in the near future. And it has a lot of employment. It creates a lot of employment. So there's a need to switch over to alternative sources of energy in order to maintain this employment. And of course, for uh, uh, sustainability. And in the other example can be that uh, in the political aspects, uh, most of the decisions which are taken, they have certain social and political repercussions. So uh, the it is difficult to make major changes. So this is one of the political uh, challenge. And in this way, uh, knowledge-based governance is needed. Then technological can be that uh, we have to move beyond simply measuring efficiency towards more uh, ecological and social impacts where uh, this uh, social cohesion actually works. And so there were different challenges, but we have been able to identify these challenges under uh, six heads. Now coming to the the uh, the qualitative and quantitative analysis. So based on the literature, we were able to identify certain determinants or certain indicators of a low carbon policy in uh, Poland, and it was found that uh, different cities uh, were at different levels of uh, of uh, these activities of these indicators. So. Uh, of course, I would not go into the detail of this, but I would just like to highlight that in, uh, for example, in Gdansk, uh, there was, uh, Gdansk had the highest uh, emissions uh, per kilometer square in the 10 largest Polish cities. And uh, Warsaw had the highest number of cars per uh, 10,000 uh, people. So these just represent the kind of the state of uh, current uh, uh, energy consumption or uh, determinants or indicators related with energy and similar uh, things were, were found for other cities but the point was that uh, they are at different levels of consumption patterns or at different levels of uh, uh, of uh, uh, energy consumption yeah so uh, then we analyzed the different low carbon uh, uh, plans for these cities and we found that majorly these plans uh, they related with either transport or with energy transition or with certain regulatory actions like rules and laws. So for example, it was found again in uh, Gdansk in, the term, in terms of energy transition, there was very less focus on uh, renewable energy sources, on developing renewable energy systems, but most of it was on em energy em efficiency. And similarly, it was found in the Warsaw or also that uh, uh, there was less focus on uh, creating renewable energy systems and mostly on energy efficiency. So based on this uh, analysis, we uh, applied K-means clustering uh, algorithm and we were able to identify three major uh, modes or three major processes of uh, energy transition and these were these were called uh, uh, multi activity goals which included transport uh, energy and other activities related with uh, green infrastructure or waste management then there were energy transition goals which were majorly related with energy transition or renewable energy systems then there were transport goals which were majorly related with transport related activities so, for example, uh, EG mode was found in uh, uh, Lublin, Wroclaw, or Bidgosh. Transport-oriented goals were found in uh, 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 Warsaw and uh, Gdansk. And coming to the conclusion, so uh, the the, uh, con the the conclusion that we could draw from this was that there are certain gaps in the way. Uh, energy policies are created for these cities in terms of what is the actual reality or the actual state of uh, uh, energy consumption or energy patterns and in the way uh, in the objectives of the different plans. So uh, this was one thing. Another thing was that there are multiple dimensions of energy uh, sustainability which have to be included, especially the uh, perception of stakeholders, the political aspects and uh, the leadership aspects. 
then uh, again one thing was identified in terms of social uh, benefits social dimensions of energy sustainability which was re related with co benefits or uh, highlighting how the uh, transition activities can help in creating co benefits particularly in terms of time uh, in the polish concept the uh, context then there was uh, uh, another thing which was creating this local perspective along with a, rela a relational framework so relational framework uh, it basically means that uh, uh, understanding how different cities are related with each other how one activity in one city can have an impact on its neighboring city so uh, but but the main uh, conclusion was to bridge the gap between plans and requirements so yeah that was all thank you thank you very much so as planned at the beginning and thank you as well for sticking with the 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 timing i didn't have to show you the, even the last uh, uh, piece of paper with one we have still one minute and stop please uh, so very much appreciated and hope to continue on this line so the next one that is going to uh, uh, present it's um, uh, my colleague from the European Commission, from the same unit where we are working, um, um, on one of the, the 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 studies that is very dear to his heart on aspects related to the greening of uh, cohesion policy in general, but at the same time of how to do uh, more of what we are currently doing and what type of actions should we put forward as commission with our legislative proposals to actually um, help even further our member states and regions. Thank you, Joachim. So again, um, 12 minutes. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Anna and Dita. I will just skip some of the of, of the slides actually because, because I have too many of them. So uh, my... My presentation is entitled Regional Climate Disparities, the Asymmetric Impacts of Climate Change on the EU Regions. I mean, we, we are currently in a phase of collecting data on, um, on um, or, or regionalizing data on climate, both um, um, emissions, impacts, costs, uh, losses and damages, adaptation and mitigation, mainly to see whether the cohesion policy, which is a key instrument for implementing the European Green Deal works, but also to support uh, um, the, the Commission's climate policy actually with a more regionalized um, assessment. I start here with, with this slide. Uh, currently, the, the planet is 1.2 degrees warmer than it was um, at pre-industrial levels. Um, in Paris, we all agreed to keep uh, uh, temperature rising uh, up to 1.5 degree, but with the current policies in place, uh, we um, project to end uh, in 2100 with a, um, with a change in temperature of plus 2.7 degrees Celsius. How does this pan out in, in Europe? Um, Europe is warming faster than, than the rest of the world. Um, we are today um, 1.5 degrees warmer already than it was in 1950, and this is a distribution that is sort of equally spread um, across the EU regions. All regions are warming um, fastly. Um, th there are, in particular, there are regional disparities in climate extremes. This is just one example. Um, the map uh, shows where summers have become hotter in the last 50 years, and that's predominantly a pattern that, that occurs, as you can see, in northwest of Europe, where we have just much hotter summers. And on the right-hand side of the graph, that's, that's, that sort of, I mean, shows what people of my age and older, I'm, I'm 50, um, what, what they experience in their life. So um, longer summers, shorter winters, and, and milder winters. So. I mean, climate change is not a scenario anymore. We are uh, experiencing, uh, we are um, living in it today. Um, these regional patterns in um, climate change are even more pronounced for um, precipitation. Um, in brown the regions uh, with less precipitation in the last 50 years, in um, green the regions with more precipitation. Um, but but I, I, I'm, 
I, I, I want you to focus on, for instance, countries like Spain, Italy, Greece with large within variations. So there's regions that are wetting and there are regions that are just drying out. Um, and if it rains, we see a pattern over the last 70 years that the rainfall is becoming much more um, intensive. Um, what are the, the costs of, of uh, climate change? Um, this is data from the European Environmental Agency. Um, currently, the average annual costs are about um, 12 billion euro per year, uh, with uh, a trend that is slightly increasing. So the last year's um, costs um, have, have become higher. Um, the peak cost for now was 2002. That was an event of flooding in Central Europe where large parts of, of Germany and, and Czechia and so on were, were flooded with costs up to 40 billion euro. Um, 21 and 22 are not included. We expect there um, to arrive outside the scale of the graph with 50 billion um, euros of uh, economic damage in 21, mainly caused by cloud bursts in, in, the, in, in the, the east of Belgium and the west of Germany, where literally several towns have been simply flushed away uh, in, in, uh, um, in, in second week of July 21. And then this year, of course, the exceptional drought that, um, that hit Europe uh, with, with uh, consequences for agricultural production, um, for uh, energy production, um, especially if you need cooling water, um, and, and for shipping and so on. Um, I'll skip just this one. What, what can we do? Uh, so, so far, I mean, globally, we have organized uh, um, uh, our addressing of climate change um, into two different actions, um, mitigation and adaptation. Um, Collectively, under cohesion policy, we are projected to plan 91 billion euro um, under the current programming period. Most of it will go to um, mitigation, so actions to actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions or reduce their concentration in the atmosphere. For instance, renewable energy is a key action to that. Much less actually goes to adaptation. There we spent over the entire programming period, I mean, the same amount of money as the costs uh, for uh, climate damages uh, per year. Um, so if we, if, we, if we exceed the 1.5, it's very likely that we also will have to increase uh, those actions that help us adapt uh, against climate change. For instance, how do we cope with increasing drought periods or with floods? And then a bit under, um, or sort of maybe underinvested, less known, are typically the actions that both mitigate uh, and help us adapt to climate change, often nature-based solutions. We spend only 3 billion on that, although they provide win-win situations. This morning, I, I um, I highlighted an example on, on, on wetlands and peatlands. It's a good example. Um, wetlands, they store water when there is too much of it. Um, they release water when there is not enough of it, uh, so to support agriculture. So it's an excellent sort of yeah, instrument to adapt against climate change. But if managed well and sustainable, Wetlands can soak up more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than forests to often at rates that are two or three times higher than forests. So you, you mitigate climate change and at the same time you uh, adapt against climate change. And um, I argue for more investments um, in, in um, these win-win situations on the edge between adaptation and mitigation. Um, Yet again, most of our focus in, in Europe, but also globally, goes to actions that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So this is the, 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 the current photo of um, greenhouse gas emissions per capita at the regional level in Europe. Regions in yellow would be regions that already meet the 2030 target of reducing emissions with 55% relative to 1990. So you see some of the regions uh, in the Mediterranean and in, in Southern Europe, but if you look carefully, you see also the capital, the capital regions, 
typically because they have a, a big population, but not necessarily the industry and um, the energy production sites that cause peak emissions. Those sites would be present in regions uh, that are in blue. So typically point sources, fossil fuel based that still cause very high emissions and that will still have to uh, go through a decarbonization path uh, to 2030. Um, I'll, I'll skip this one also. What can we do um, to reduce emissions? Um, many uh, climate mitigation options are now available. This comes from the IPCC, uh, its sixth assessment report on, on mitigation, and it lists all the actions that are globally available to come to a net zero emission of uh, by, 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 20, by 2050. So the technology is there. Uh, and moreover, the IPCC quantified, I calculated how much each of these um, mitigation actions can actually contribute to a uh, net zero um, or, or to carbon neutrality. Um, three sort of options dominate um, solar and wind, so the complete rollout of renewable energy, the work on ecosystems, and then fuel switching, which is essentially uh, moving to a hydrogen based economy. And taken together in Europe, I mean, if we if we implement them now in Europe, they 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 would say forty two percent of today's greenhouse gas um, emissions. So let's have a look at at, uh, at at these sort of scalable solutions because that's that's their advantage. I mean, the technology for solar and wind is is cheap, is under reference levels, so it's it's massively upscalable. The same for ecosystem restoration and sustainable agriculture, a bit less so for fuel switching. Um, if we look at the gross energy production in the EU then still 42% of our energy comes from combustible fuels, so oil and gas and coal. About 25% comes from nuclear, and then the rest, 30%, is, is today is um, renewable energy, wind, hydropower, and solar. This is, this is actually the, the, the technical potential in the EU of producing um, um, renewable energy, wind, and solar. So there is a technical capacity present to produce three times the total electricity demand of today, mainly in the regions in yellow. So Spain, Romania, Ireland, uh, the Baltics, and, and, uh, and Sweden, but also regions in, in, in green can produce um, high amounts of, of wind and solar energy. And some of these regions are actually called regions in transition. So if you would implement there at scale um, renewable energy, you can have a win-win situation, reducing coal and replacing it with renewables. Why would you produce three times the amount of, of electricity um, that, that you need mainly to switch to a hydrogen-based economy. Um, annual production in the EU is currently a bit, uh, bit just under um, 3,000 terawatt hours. It's mainly produced in the regions in purple, but those regions have currently the technical facilities and capacities to produce um, hydrogen. Demand will increase, Repower EU will triple the demand by 2030, um, and then energy suppliers estimate demand for hydrogen in 2050 uh, to, to be tenfold. All in all, the, the, the regions in Europe that currently produce hydrogen, they have sufficient wind, solar, and hydrogen resources to actually cover all the current demand and consumption, but also to ensure that a shift to green hydrogen is possible. That green hydrogen you would use mainly for industrial processes, heavy industry, think steel, chemistry, and so on, but also heavy duty transport, um, lorries, um, and, and, and ships. Um, I mean, Having technical potential is one thing, but the problem also remains if 
the, the, the social economic fabric and, and, and the, the economic conditions in regions have to be there to also make the transition. And there was this morning a talk by, um, um, by Thomas Schwab on this, identifying those regions in red where we expect that, that we would have to I mean, further develop them, uh, further ensure that the social and, and economic fabric is uh, present to move to a green transition. Finally, ecosystems, also very scalable. Um, reforestation, afforestation, reforestation, and a more sustainable um, agriculture, storing much more carbon in the agricultural soil are part of the solution. They will become essential and they provide win-win-win situations. That means we mitigate climate change by reducing emissions. We, uh, we allow um, our ecosystems will enable us to, to adapt against climate change forests. They store water, they, they cool down cities during heat waves, but they also provide plenty of other um, ecosystem services. So they, I mean, investing in ecosystems just makes regions much more resilient uh, to climate change. In conclusion, um, so, yeah, we have spatially explicit uh, temperature extremes and precipitation patterns across the EU. Um, also by degree of urbanization, I didn't show that, uh, with, which is causing currently losses that are at least 11 billion uh, per year. Uh, these costs are projected to increase. So the, the question also there is, are we under investing in um, climate change adaptation? Um, we can scale up wind and solar production, hydrogen production and ecosystem restoration, and by doing so, further decrease emissions with 42% in the EU. Um, and if you look carefully at the maps, th this might open the door for opportunities in rural regions and coal regions in transition who could help uh, achieve the common EU climate target. Um, we would have to move to more climate cohesion inside the EU. That means ensuring that regions with high mitigation potential have the social and economic conditions to absorb the green investments, but also ensure that um, the next cohesion policy is forward looking, more targeted and place based um, in order to cope with mitigation and adaptation issues. And then finally, uh, building a stronger regional climate uh, resilience by working with nature, not against it, and by providing the right incentives for a restoration economy that can help revive rural and agricultural regions. Thank you. I'm 57 seconds, seconds late. late. I saw it. <laughs> I saw it, but I refrain from using the stop uh just for less than a minute of uh, of uh, delay. Uh, so I think we're gonna um, also listen now in the first part to uh, Leila's presentation. Great, so like that, um, we open the, 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 se the session for questions and answers, and then we'll go to the last uh, speakers in the panel, Aurore and uh, Francesco. Yeah, very good. So um, Leila? You have the floor and um, I'm going to maybe give you the opportunity as well to say a few words about the university. Uh -huh. Thank you well. very much. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Lela Tienic and I'm coming from the University of Pula here in Croatia. And um, this paper is actually the first step maybe in uh, developing more co complex paper about uh, tracking the green transition with my colleague Ines kersan Um this team is actually something that we are trying to investigate uh, now, but uh, because of, of course, of the importance of the team, but um, some, some issues have uh, been seen in the literature and also with the data. So uh, this paper actually is a draft paper. So we hope to uh, finish uh, research maybe in some other uh, investigations. But uh, I will try to present uh, the pre preliminary results um, that we have uh, collected until now and hope maybe to have some new ideas how to finish uh, the, the beginning of this research. So tracking the green transition in the European Union, uh, 
of course, theme that was also conferred as important in previous paper. And uh, we have also uh, started with, thank you, uh, started with the literature uh, to see the motivation for this theme. Uh, of course, we have seen today also numerous indicators that imply on the need to investigate this theme and to actually develop a new approach to management development. Um, this is important actually also in the European Union, but also on the global level. Uh, European Union has chosen to uh, develop the green and the digital transition. This paper is focused on the first one. So uh, one of the important pay, uh, questions here is how to track the green transition. Why? Uh, it is obvious because it is necessary to create better guidelines for the next programming period and uh, also for the future, but uh, also uh, because uh, we are facing the uh, significant uh, consequences of this uh, challenging environment and the consequences that, as we uh, heard before, we are living today. So uh, how to do this is something that uh, we want to investigate here, and uh, we will see uh, preliminary results on this and uh, some previous papers watch, uh, which were uh, performed on this team, what, uh, what was uh, their result. Uh, so we are all well known with the complexity of green policies uh, that also uh, makes this job more complex. Uh, because the, this complexity uh, is also seen is in uh, measuring the effects. Uh, so uh, we are here faced with uh, some uh, issues regarding the including of different domains of the green policies in the investigation. Uh, this paper uh, is focused on the achievements uh, which are connected with the green transition from the side of the European structural and investment funds and from the side of the performed evaluation reports until now. So we will see the results uh, that are known for today, but uh, we are hoping to maybe in future uh, researchers to develop some models that will uh, evaluate the effects of the investments from the European Structural and Investment Funds on the some chosen um, output indicators, but we are not sure which one because the complexity of green policies is also uh, seen here. So uh, the theoretical background for this paper also uh, includes different aspects on uh, defining and measuring the green policies, green growth, green development, different aspects that are uh, necessary to uh, investigate when we are tracking the green transition. So here can we see different uh, approaches on previous investigations about the uh, accomplishing green deal goals and other goals that are uh, connected with the uh, green growth. Uh, but also we have uh, tried to collect some uh, previous researchers that uh, monitor the sustainable green growth and development. In that researchers, we have seen that there are papers that analyze, for example, some case studies and uh, uh, aspects that are seen in uh, some uh, specific countries. But uh, until now, we didn't find much literature that um, includes, uh, for example, the whole European Union or a group of countries or regions also. So uh, here we are actually trying to uh, see maybe the best model that will uh, be included to estimate the effects of instruments to achieve these goals. Instruments here we are focused on the European structural and investment funds. Uh, so the contribution of this paper uh, is expected to be in the evaluation and the estimation actually of the effects. Uh, the main research questions for this paper is to um, analyze and give a review of the, of the achievements, but um, the final version of this paper would be directed to the estimation on the effects. So uh, according to the some evaluation reports, uh, we uh, also uh, have analyzed some reports and uh, evaluation reports, but also some scientific studies that are using also in some of these uh, publications and of, of course other uh, scientific studies. Uh, so uh, let's take a brief look uh, on what we have found in the literature. So uh, first of all, in the final, in the last actually uh, eight cohesion report, we can see uh, really that there is a chapter that is connected with the greener and low carbon Europe. And also we have there um, interesting progress in green Europe and analysis, analysis of greener Europe indicators. 
um, which also confirmed the motivation for uh, these kind of studies. Um, another report that we have um, investigated is our um, evaluation reports, for example, this summary report last summary report that is um, published. And uh, we can see really that uh, from the aspect of the European Structural and Investment Funds, about 60% of the plan total is directed for the sustainable bubble growth. Uh, this is something that we can look in more detail. For example, if we look at different thematic areas that are connected with this goal, uh, we can see the distribution is uh, different from the aspect of low carbon energy until network infrastructure in transport and energy. Um, these uh, indicators are actually um, something higher uh, today because uh, the publication was published in 2021. According to the last available data from this month, we have some better uh, progress in the first, uh, first and last category, of course, uh, which is expected um, according to the thematic area because the projects in these areas need some time to get implemented. Uh, in the relation reports, we can, we can also find some um, climate change object objectives and the distribution of uh, funds uh, to these objectives. We can see that uh, one of the most, most important funds here are actually European Regional and Development Fund um, with Cohesion Fund and with the fund um, uh, European Agricultural and Development Fund. So uh, we can find the, the, the different distributions in, uh, in the uh, spending amount. And uh, this is something that will also um, have the implication in the future uh, programming periods. Um, uh, of course, we can find some uh, achievements in these reports, which uh, which can be used maybe as an outcome uh, indicators in some more complex matters. Um, some uh, other evaluation that we can find uh, is strategic reports from the 2019, and also some thematic evaluations that um, are focused on specific thematic areas. For example, we were interested in this uh, exposed evaluation, and it also confirms the significance of the European Structural and Investment Funds in um, contributing to these areas. Um, according to the results of the uh, research of evaluations, we can see that um, more than 400 evaluations deal with the uh, mentioned themes. And um, maybe one approach in some other papers would be also to investigate these evaluations to see maybe to extract some significant results that can be the basis for some other analysis. Um, according to the databases, there are a lot of indicators which can be used as a background for further analysis. Uh, of course, the uh, data about the uh, green, uh, European Green Deal and sustainable growth development, circular economy, um, other thematic areas of the Eurostat can be uh, used as a, maybe just the beginning of the research. But we can also include this uh, here some uh, common indicators that are used for um, publication uh, of the data in uh, open data uh, portal. So uh, as we can see, there are a lot of indicators that can be used, but uh, so we are now interested in which indicators to use to, be uh, to perform the better results that uh, will be focused on the, our interests, uh, for example, on the effects of the European Structural Investment Funds. Uh, and of course, uh, on some outcomes that can be uh, see here. Maybe there is one opportunity to uh, connect these indicators to use maybe some multivariate uh, analysis to uh, extract some synthetic indicators that will include uh, different aspects of these indicators. But we must be uh, aware here that uh, we must um, include as uh, much as possible um, uh, useful in the in, uh, information from these indicators and not to lose some aspects. So th this is something with, that we can uh, develop maybe in some other researches, or we can just use some econometric analysis to estimate the relationship between the investments uh, under the European Structural Investment Funds and some common indicators. But this is maybe not the best approach because we will lose some information that are hidden in, in some of other indicators. According to the Cohesion Policy Data Porter, we can see some uh, results on uh, uh, spending amounts uh, for, for EU member states. Uh, and we can look, uh, of course, on uh, some countries that are better in performing and uh, unfortunately on the last uh, position on this uh, rank. 
but um, which is uh, what is here important is that uh, we need more data about uh, this um, uh, this is a aspects because uh, we are uh, faced with the fact that we have data on spending according to the low carbon economy but we need maybe more detailed uh, data that will uh, enable us to investigate uh, the best possible uh, effects of course the possibility to include also regional data is something that should be highlighted here. Um, the best maybe um, uh, way to, to analyze this data is to have the data on regional level and on thematic and by thematic concentrations according to the most detailed um, aspects of this, this, uh, these thematic areas. But this is something that is still still developing. So uh, these are some. Uh, this is some review on the best and the lowest performing countries, but uh, this is something that we can uh, all uh, look actually in the in the in the database portal. But what what we want to uh, estimate is actually the effect of these investments, and to conclude uh, this presentation with some final ideas is. Uh, something that we are hoping to develop maybe in the final version of this paper. So, uh, of course, according to the theoretical background, it is uh, seen that uh, it is necessary to connect different policies within uh, environmental aspects and goals, but this also must be uh, connected in the measuring approaches. So uh, difference between the EU member states are uh, visible and uh, uh, a lot of efforts should be given on countries that are on the bottom of this uh, rank. A uh, new programming period uh, opens new possibilities, of course, with the instruments such as Just Transition Fund, which, which will be one of the funds uh, important as well as other uh, SE funds. And uh, we also uh, should connect these different approaches uh, in um, approaching the instruments uh, with the uh, environmental aspects in different policies. So um, a combination actually of these uh, instruments would be something that is uh, useful. And of course, uh, we hope that we will uh, achieve the best spending rates, but uh, we must target our goals. And uh, actually to target the goals, we have to measure the previous effects and to give some conclusions and recommendations for the future periods. Thank you very much. Much food for thought, yes. We've had a nice uh, journey starting from the, the other way around because I, I think your presentation is more on the sort of uh, macro level of analysis, tracking in general, green, um, uh, green spending and the green uh, transition and the way you can link indicators with real investments on the ground. Uh, then we've seen a little bit the perspective of regional Yes, so regions and how they cope with the challenges ahead and how cohesion policy is trying to help these regions both in the process of adaptation and mitigation. And then we went a little bit, you know, like a further level down and we went to the cities and looked at the urban uh, low carbon uh, strategies with a specific focus in uh, Central Europe. But a lot of the things that you have put forward could actually be said for other parts of Europe as well, not just on Central Europe. So, food for thought. And uh, the now, is, I think, is the moment to open the floor and to give you the possibility to um, um, express, put forward your questions. Please don't forget to say who you are in your um, affiliation and also to whom you are addressing the question. Yes, thank you. There is a microphone over there and um, who is breaking the ice? Uh, if not, I always have questions. Huh? So <laughs> yes, please, over there. Hello, does it work? Yes, it uh, is. <laughs> okay, my name is Ombre Mokor and I work at the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies in Austria. And uh, I have a question for Mr. Mais. Uh, you presented a map, uh, I think, showing um, CO2 emissions per region. And of course, we can see, of course, lots of disparities. Of course, there are cold regions. Some are, of course, uh, doing much better. I think it was CO2 emissions per capita, of course. I have a question because 
I think the Fit for 55 goals and also the climate neutrality target are EU level targets. Maybe they have been translated, of course, at national level, maybe, but certainly not at regional level. Do you see any room for some kind of trading or compensation between regions? Coal regions can remain carbon intensive if other regions would just uh, reduce much, much more and then achieve this overall target? Or do you think maybe, of course, it's not the best solution, but can we envisage a situation where we have coal intensive and coal free or carbon intensive and carbon free regions in Europe? So first to be clear, there is certainly no regional um, emissions target. So there is the, the minus 55% indeed at EU level. And I just sort of assumed that if all EU citizens could contribute equally to the target, then um, you can translate the target that every citizen consumes 5.6 tons of CO2 equivalents per person per year. So that's that's sort of where it comes from, but it's not a, it's definitely not a target. I mean, given that the target is EU level, I don't see the reason why uh, there, 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 there can be um, carbon sources and carbon sinks at the same time within the EU. Um, and um, for instance, certainly rural regions, and I focus again on, on, on solutions like forestation or improving soil quality. I mean, th there might be, be regions that, that uh, by 2050, I mean, consume or, or absorb much more carbon that really become a carbon sink instead of a carbon source. Um, that I can imagine that at some point that can be used to tackle to, to tackle questions or to help regions and sectors where decarbonization is very difficult. A very well known example is cement industry, for instance. So the only solution for cement industry for the moment is um, carbon capture. So allowing that carbon is emitted to the atmosphere, but capturing it actually before it is emitted and then transporting it all back. These costs are, are I, mean, I mean, very high. And then I can imagine at some point you have a negotiation or a conclusion where you say maybe there is a region that, that actually um, absorbs more carbon at the, at, at the benefit of another one that still emits. Tomasz Grudzicki from Nikolaus Copernicus University in Torun, Poland. I also have a question to Joachim. I was very much interested into methodological part of the uh, economic cost. So you mentioned it cost us 12 billion uh, you know, euros per year. So I would be very much interested in how do you measure that? So what's the methodology behind this number? Thank you very much. The data that I showed, they are uh, they are provided by the European Environment Agency. So it's it's part of their mandate to actually come up with these costs. And um, the, the the source of this data is um, is is research and academia that that collects information and databases. But that that's one part of the story. So that's that's the the observ the actual observations of the costs. Um, next to this, we also um, collaborate with a joint research center um, to estimate the, 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 the costs of loss and damage um, based on scenarios. So we look at um, global warming scenarios and we try to estimate what is the economic costs in terms of agriculture, forestry, storms, floods, droughts, tourism, and sort of sectors that are directly impacted. Um, and 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 we, we combine these two sources of information. But I'm happy. I mean, I'm happy to to give you the exact um, coordinates to find the work. Any further questions, um, more specifically for the other colleagues as well? Uh, maybe um, maybe Pramit. Um, a question would be because it was very interesting the way you were. Um, presenting you know like the different links in between um how to how to bring together how to connect the dots in between um 
uh, investments at the urban level in general, but specific investments into, you know, like a low carbon type of investments, energy uh, type of investments, and relate that with the residents' participation. So um, you'd have the democratic uh, uh, element of the debate and at the same time, the investment element of the debate brought together. And what I was missing a little bit from the, the, the presentation um, for different obvious uh, reasons among which uh, time, so I'm to be blamed for, uh, is um, what, how do you propose this concretely? Do you and your team come up with concrete recommendations or proposals of how to better link this type of, uh, uh, of investments in the urban framework? Uh, yeah, so uh, basically this was the first part of the work that we are doing. And uh, right now we are also working on a, a survey-based analysis. In, and in the conclusions, I talked about the importance of co-benefits. So what we are now finding out that uh, creating local resilience needs some concrete steps. And one of them could be uh, by uh, explaining the co-benefits to the actual stakeholders. So in terms of investments, I can share that uh, uh, in Poland, there are many subsidies which are given to people to switch from uh, coal-based boilers or uh, for heating purposes to uh, electric-based uh, heating systems. And those subsidies actually, uh, people are able to use those subsidies for even more uh, 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 retrofitting, retrofitting in their homes. So not just for switching to renew to cleaner energy, but to uh, invest it in in all other activities also. And then uh, when people switch to this uh, uh, elect electric based uh, heating system, so they have a lot of time also that they don't have to put the coal inside the boiler and although that time is uh, is saved and this is very important for the people who are at an age where this uh, activity becomes difficult so one of the concrete things that we will be proposing is this the importance of co-benefits and how they can be exploited more in this way and uh, uh, another aspect that we are uh, we will be proposing is about uh, uh, engaging stakeholders in policy so this is kind of a general thing which is all recommended by uh, most people but uh, how we can engage uh, stakeholders into policies is something that that we will be investigating so mm -hmm. yeah okay that would be really interesting and very useful uh, to have this type of more concrete examples of how to do that and and, and then of course to pass to the next level which would be to have policy concrete policy recommendations uh, on that which is the same type of uh, of uh, advice that i would also give for your research you know like answering to your question you know like what, what to do from here from the description of the situation i need to go a step further and especially i need to link it to the policy and the way it should evolve if we want a further greening uh, of the policy if um, there are no further questions, um, I would propose to pass to the next uh, presentation. So it's uh, Aurora coming up. It's Aurora Dutka from the Dutka, yes, <laughs> from the University of uh, Milano, yes, please. Or s'il te plaît. So. Uh... Good afternoon, everybody. So I am going to be to try to be very short, but to present to you what I'm thinking and theory that is going to give you data to the University of Milan. So I am going to answer the question of the uh, online perspective and of course of my colleague Jim and my counterpart to have one with some of uh, my uh, preliminary results from uh, this research I am uh, initiating. So uh, I have been working. No, no, no. It's okay. Just uh, uh, not. Uh, what? Voila. So I have been working this last year about energy communities. So 
what is an energy community uh, to explain or to remind you if we look to the renewable uh, uh, renewable energy directive it's uh, so it's local actors who can be citizens local authorities or social uh, or enterprise small or medium enterprise uh, building an energy uh, community project in their local space so we have a strong attention normally on the democratic process of uh, of uh, this project, but also strong attention to the outcome, which will be local, uh, benefiting to the local communities. And today, energy communities are growing very much because uh, we have already more than 3,500 initiatives in the European Union, and but also it expects to be that until 2050, 37% of the urban citizens join this kind of initiative. So if we think in terms of third country governance, energy community will be a central mode of uh, this energy transition based on a local based approach. So uh, energy communities are very nice, you know, because you have a lot of positive impact. Economic, great green job, uh, also saving on the price of your energy. Uh, you can also raise awareness about uh, how to consume energy. And also, uh, it's uh, also seen as a way to include or generally exclude of the energy uh, of the energy market as poor people. So which comes out between uh, 50 million and uh, 125 people in the European Union. So it's very important. So they have been very emphasis for their social and political potential to shift toward not only so energy transition, but democratic and fair energy transition. So, but, and it was a little my interrogation during my PhD. It's not so easy to build an energy community. You have a lot of barriers. So first, you have to find money to make it. I don't know if some of you have really installed solar panel at your home or, uh, or storage battery. Me, I did, and it cost a lot of money. So you have to find this out. So do it. Then you need specific competencies. Energy has been for a long time uh, considered in a top-down approach. So people are not aware. Uh, uh, what is energy and uh, how to deal with, especially for women who have a strong gender stereotypes because energy is, a, is seen as a STEAM field. So uh, energy community are very complex and it's very likely that only a small part of the people really feel able to tackle with this issue. And, but it was film five at the time I initiated my PhD and this why I proposed to uh, two main European uh, energy communities, so EcoPower in Belgium and Enosqua, we did a study about uh, first woman in energy community, but also democracy and justice. So uh, I will just present you some results regarding uh, eco power, which is one of the uh, most important uh, energy communities in the European Union. And in this study, I collect 5,100 uh, uh, answers, so giving a picture of people participating in energy community. So as you can see, uh, for example, regarding the level of income, you have only 11% of people having an income under the median. So it's already, uh, and the level of studies are so strong discriminant. So I just put some descriptive results on this. So, but uh, for a chapter book, I also re realize an intersectionality analysis of inequalities. And for example, also if you have a STEAM degree, you have a lot of discriminant to join this initiative. And I put also, uh, Repartition of women by income in this uh, community because it's been very important to me to tell you that only 2% of uh, four women uh, are participating to this initiative. And it's very worrying because women are at the core of uh, domestic, uh, of domestic um, household and also caring for children. And also it's women the most touched by uh, energy pollution with indoor pollution. So the most, uh, so, and then when asking also to uh, energy community shareholders, but do you care for this? So I was expecting that because energy community are in theory uh, animating by a strong social justice principle that everybody like, oh yes, yes, we are keen to fight against energy poverty. Or we are agree with the fact that uh, uh, our way to, to function should be based on the principle one people, one vote. It was far from being the case. And uh, so it's very worrying that at the end, uh, only one people out of two, for example, agree with the principle people won't vote, or they don't feel that they have to uh, to fight against energy poverty, that it's not my role. So it was, uh, voila. So from this, this summer, I went, or maybe they will, 
on my mom plays because uh, I have a little boy, so generally, you know, summer holidays, grandmothers. And I come from a very poor place of France. And uh, they also seem to, we are also going to receive the nuclear waste. It's called Bure in France. So it's really what I come from, what is called a deprived area, rural deprived area. And uh, when I was, so on holidays, I was looking and seeing a lot of wind power installation everywhere. But no renewable energy projects like energy community. And to my mind, it comes this idea that social inequalities, like the place I come from, where has to be also related with um, territorial inequalities and the idea of distributional justice. Because in the poor place, at the end, it's very likely, it's few likely that energy community project will be developed. And indeed, if the situation, not all segments of the population are willing to participate in sustainability initiative and open sustainability initiative on work for deprived and low income communities. So to my mind, and it's why I initiated this new research project, it was very important also to relate to this problematic and to show that if we think uh, energy transition as a local class based approach, the risk is to produce, but also uh, to reproduce, but also produce this kind of inequalities because not all territories have the capacity to tackle with energy transition, especially the citizen and local territory in the deprived area. And so the risk with this idea of, of polycentric governance was to reinforce the marginalization of some territories. Uh, so you can see some uh, voilà, data of uh, energy partage in France. So uh, regarding the repartition of uh, energy community projects. And so I come more like to explain, but we have a high potential in terms of renewable energy, but fast no project. And uh, it was also confirmed by the work of Maniani the University of Trento, that generally in this place, you have a lot of private actors coming, but not citizen mobilization. So uh, I was looking um, to a case which can uh, give me some hope <laughs> and so to see how in this play, in this deprived era, some project have managed despite of everything to emerge. And I find one in the, ca in the case of Los Sanguel in France, in the north, so more or less. Project, but you will understand then why. And so Los Angeles has been very touched by uh, where they were. It's in this area people were used to live uh, from mean exploitation. In the in the 80s, mean close, and you have like uh, 5,000 people out of 8,000 losing their job. And it was not about only the job; it was about the self-esteem of them. Because, for example, Los becomes sadly known in the world to be the broken man for uh, alcoholic rate, newborn, diabetes, conch. And uh, we have also a case where the, I don't know if you like, if you look at football, but in 2008, the supporter of Paris Saint-Germain uh, take a band role, say, uh, uh, Northern people have blood pedophile, alcoholic, so you know, and he went also in justice, a strong, strong discrimination against the North. And another issue for us was also the, because of the mean exploitation, nitrate pollution. Uh, also land subsistence and uh, industrial wasteland. But despite of this, the municipality has been very, like really great job and they initiate to think about how we will dynamize uh, the city of Los. And they, they base a lot of the development on, uh, on culture, on event. And in 2010, they initiate to see that it was working, but not so well as it used to be because uh, people, young generation, initiate to think it was not so, uh, doesn't make sense. So they try to base a new resilience on the idea of energy community and a solar plan. The first step was to put on the church of the city a solar panel. And the municipalities uh, say that they were winning like 4,000 euros per year thanks to this small project. Los Angeles is a city of 7,000 habit inhabitants. So for them, it was quite big. And so uh, then they say, okay, we managed to make the church. Now we are going to make a project which is going to, to cost. So as you see, it's a big project, a, a group of the municipality for uh, 571,000 of euro. And Los is one of the poorest city of France. So how they do that? So it was my, uh, it's my interrogation is 
on this issue I am working by asking what network of actors has been managing to implant and develop this community and how they have been allowed to compensate for the lack of resources at this table. So you have the image, maybe is the image maybe of energy community led by local citizens and which are going to change. Alors, the first, how this energy community has been developed. It's very complex. So especially in the private era, it took times. It asked for intermediary structure and uh, it's not going to emerge alone. So I have no time because I have only 15 minutes to, to present you and to comment all the graphic, but uh, to make it so the municipality first is at the core of the project. And it has been asking for external resources at the beginning. And then uh, the local citizen have always been implicated, but at the beginning, by local association because citizens say, okay, we are interesting, but we are not involved. We don't understand how it works. So then they decide to constitute a society. And a very, very important thing, which is now in France, is the creation of economic, economic society, which are intermediate in the, uh, organization financing by uh, the regional level and which allow to, uh, to mobilize financial assets, but also competency, because building an energy community is not easy at all in terms of technical performance, um, in terms of te technical uh, staff, but also administrative. And then when they create the society in du Soleil, they then only decide to open the capital to citizens. The citizens which have always been included, as I told you, uh, thanks to association. And then they collect more money than they expect. So they collect uh, for, uh, 45,000 uh, euros, so for a small city and for one of the poorest cities of France, it was really unexpected. So the municipality then has to reinvest in the project. So uh, to give you some numbers, at the end with the contribution of the SEM, but also Sonelis, which is the private installer, on the total cost of the project, so you remember, 571,000, the municipality put 20,000 euros. And so you see in terms of business model, it's not so bad. And now Los Angeles is becoming very famous. So the society is working. We are going to have the first return on equity and we have strong interaction. For example, the SEM helps the local citizen to make the financial uh, documentation for the General Assembly. And you have also uh, 1,000 experts visiting LOS each year to learn about. And uh, the result now, and it's why it's very interesting in terms of spin-off, because uh, the project Min, uh, uh, Min du Soleil is going to make uh, to raising new capital because new local shareholders, new citizens want to enter in the project, but also new city, for example, the city of Lens, which is near from Los Angeles, want also to participate in the project with their local citizen. And also uh, some municipality, for example, the place where I come, we also want to go to Los <laughs> to visit. And uh, so we are also replicating this kind of model. So voila. So uh, now I am making more qualita quantitative studies, social network analysis, and shoulders, and voila. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you when you were actually uh, about to tell us a couple, couple of uh, implications, recommendations. Maybe we'll get to that in the questions and answer session. But I think it's just fair to give Francesco also a little bit of time for his uh, presentation. So Francesco, please, that's your. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm Francesco Scotti, pro postdoctoral researcher from Politecnico di Milano. I present my research, cohesion policy and the green transition, the policy mix to boost innovation and cut emissions in Europe. Also on the behalf of my co-authors, Andrea Flori, Riccardo Crescenzi and Fabio Famolli. This work focuses on the combined and joint impact of EU cohesion policy and other regulation at European level on the sustainability transition. Actually, the low carbon economy is a key priority area within the EU cohesion policy, which is supported by four different thematic objectives that target climate change, environment protection, resource efficiency, and sustainable transportation. As a result, more than 20% of EU cohesion policy budget during the programming period 2014-2020 has been allocated to the sustainability transition. However, this is a complex process. It involves multifaceted stakeholders. It actually requires long time frames, 
and involves relevant transformation of extant production and consumption system. Therefore, researchers and practitioners suggest that a focus on a single regulation is a too narrow approach, and they suggest that a combination of complementary policy instruments should be required to drive such profound transformation. At European level, two different kinds of policies can support the cohesion policy. The first one is repre represented by technology push policies, which are public subsidies, research and development programs aiming to stimulate production of innovative green technology. On the other hand, we have demand pool policies, which are like white certificate, emission trading schema, aiming to boost the demand of clean technologies. In this research, as an example of technology push policy, we consider Horizon 2020, which is the largest funding program for research and innovation, aiming to achieve sustainable development goals. For what concerns demand pool policy, we focus on emission trading system, as it represents the largest trading greenhouse gas market for allowances, covering more than 45% of overall greenhouse gases emissions at European level. We focus on the policy mix, as these uh, complex policy packages are usually not the result of an explicit policy strategy, but more a de facto accumulation of instruments and initiatives. Therefore, it is not clear whether they mutually strengthen each other, or if instead they weaken their interaction and even toward the overall energy policy impact. This lie should clarify our empirical setting. Our analysis is made at firm level, and in terms of demand pool policy, we consider the EU ATS, while for technology push instruments, we consider structural and cohesion funds and Horizon and 2020 funds. Our target group, the treated group of firms, is represented by those firms that are both liable entities under the EU ATS and that are beneficiaries of structural cohesion funds and Horizon 2020 funds. Our group of control is represented by firm just liable entities under UATS, while we exclude from the control group subsidiaries of firms under UATS and receiving structural cohesion funds and Horizon 2020 funds in order to avoid spillover. As a, as a consequence, our objective is to disentangle the impact of the policy mix on the sustainability transition in terms of patent application and CO2 emissions with respect to firms under demand pool policy. In particular, we studied the heterogeneity of these effects across sectors and countries. Moreover, we are interested in investigating the mechanism that may lead research funds as structural and cohesion funds and Horizon 2020 to have an additional positive impact on innovation performance of firms. And we hypothesize that technology push instruments allow to foster early stages of innovation process allowing firms to trigger additional research and development activities with respect to the case in which they are just under the pool policies. In terms of data, we have uh, around, we cover around 1,000 firms over Europe with a higher concentration in Germany, Italy, Spain, France, and Czech Republic. While in terms of sector, 85% of our data set uh, is represented by manufacturing and firms in the energy sector. We collect data on the beneficiaries of structural cohesion funds from the data set of the European Commission, while data on liable entities under UATS are taken from the UATL data set. Patents data come from PATSTAT, while other financial and economic information are collected by Orbis. Therefore, a value added of the research is also the integration of information and data across heterogeneous data sources, which allows us to answer original research question at the intersection between economics, environment, and innovation. In terms of methods, we apply the recently introduced dynamic panel 11 study by Callaway and Santana, which allows to deal with some more traditional problem of standard difference in different applications, such as the negative weighting uh, problem. Our dependent variable is either yearly cumulative number of patents application or CO2 over total assets. Uh, we, despite the literature focus on uh, patents, we use also this second type of dependent variable for two main reasons. First, because not all uh, um, firms patent their technologies in the green environment, and therefore just focusing on patents may hide some dynamics in the evolution of environmental technologies. Furthermore, CO2 emission reduction is the main target of equation policy, and therefore we believe that this could be a relevant outcome variable to monitor. We focus on the uh, dynamic average treatment effect, which measure the effects of being under treatment when firms are 
exactly observe E time periods, which in this case are years away from the start of the treatment. When we uh, investigate the mechanism driving the additional impact of technology push instruments, we rely on a standard two-way fixed effects model where our dependent variable is defined as in the previous slide, while our regressive of interest is the intangible asset as we suspect that the innovation performances might be explained by additional research and development activities, which are triggered by this fund. In terms of results, we find heterogeneous results across sectors with a positive impact of the policy mix on the energy sector, support increase in patents application between 1.4 and 2.1%. Notice how the magnitude of the coefficient is growing over time, suggesting long-term positive effects and sometimes which is required before patents are um, implemented. Uh, in this case, we do not find any significant impact when we consider firms across all sector or when we focus on the manufacturing sector. We explain these results by the fact that the energy sector is an oligopoly characterized by low market fragmentation with high, with high frequent change in price. Therefore, what we expect is that when firms in this sector are just subject to demand pool policies, they have the possibility to transfer the extra cost of carbon price to the final user without implementing innovation, while when they receive also funds, they perceive the commitment of society toward this green transition, and they are willing to meet society expectation by raising patents application. We perform also an heterogeneity analysis at country level in order to further uh, investigate this mechanism. We use three different uh, uh, indicators in order to show um, the, the relevance of the cost transfer uh, at um, country level. I have no time to show the results, but from the main output, we find high evidence of uh, cost transfer in Czech Republic and France, mixed evidence in Italy, Poland, and UK, and low evidence in Germany and Spain. When we repeat the, ana the previous analysis across these countries, we find that, as expected, the higher coefficient and the higher impact is observed in those countries, France and Czech Republic, where we observe higher evidence of cost transfer, while almost limited or uh, absence of significant impact in Germany and Spain, where we have uh, found lower relevance of the cost transfer. Thus, supporting our hypothesis that the impact of the policy mix is relevant in those cases where firms can easily implement the cost transfer mechanism. For what concerns the mechanism for which these uh, Structural and cohesion funds and Horizon 2020 funds might trigger better environmental performances. We first compare the level of intangible assets of beneficiaries of the policy mix and the control units. We observe that in the year before the start of the treatment, the two groups had comparable level of intangible assets, while the difference becomes significant after that uh, the beneficiary of policy mix starts receiving these funds. Thus, meaning that these type of funds are not crowding out other type of investment, but on the other hand, they are triggering additional research and development activities. In particular, we saw that intangible assets have a positive impact on patent application and reduction of CO2 emissions. And in particular, 1% growth in the intangible assets induce a 0.4% growth in patent applications, and then elasticity equal to minus 0.2 in terms of reduction of CO2 emissions. That's confirming that public finance solve some liquidity issues of firms and becomes an enabler of exploration activities, justifying better performances in the environmental sector for these firms. As a main policy implication, we can say that we have studied the impact of the policy mix from a quantitative perspective, showing that it's effective heterogeneous across sector with a positive effect in the energy sector and where it can be easily implemented mechanisms that allow to avoid a full internalization of carbon costs in their investment decision. Furthermore, we have shown that these funds can trigger additional R&D activities while they're not substituting and crowding out other type of investment. Our results contribute to the literature on factors that drive the environmental transition and how this impact is affected by market conditions, and they can support policymakers in a better optimization of the allocation of these resources across sectors in order to optimize the environmental transition. Thank you for your attention. I hope in a fruitful discussion. So we're almost there. Um, 
the coffee break is um, expecting us. So let's see um, the questions that you may have for uh, Aurora and Francesco, and then try to wrap up the discussion and continue over uh, uh, coffee or a glass of water. So questions, please. And maybe. Thank you. Um, I'm Nelly. I'm working in the European Parliament, uh, mainly on regional development matters. Um, I was overall surprised, um, or maybe this is just too narrow thinking, maybe too nerdy, because I work on these issues uh, quite some time, um, that the term of just transition fund was missing. Leila mentioned it in the end in her conclusions. Um, and I would be interested on your assessment if you have any thoughts, um, Leila, and maybe also Aurore pour toi <laughs> la question. Um, uh, how you think, what do you think about the involvement of regions, municipalities, and citizens in the just transition plans, especially when it comes maybe to energy communities? Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it for now. Not sure okay. that uh, Aurora really went into that direction with the study, but. Uh... Yeah, but it is a new instrument, so good question, of course. Uh, it's the beginning of uh, planning the development plans for using the fund. So uh, it is expected to be proactive in the future to use the best possible uh, the fund that is uh, new for, for all regions. For example, in our country, I think that we are just planning the programs for this and that we will use the after the the adoption of this program, the, the uh, available fund. So maybe this is the reason why we are still uh, investigating the beginning of uh, this uh, possibility. But uh, I think that it is a good instrument as um, added uh, value to the previous uh, instruments because it is uh, directed and focused on the problems that are really uh, seen now and that uh, it is also uh, necessary for the regions that are not only less developed that then this is uh, important also for the transition regions that are very often in that uh, trap so uh, this will be also opportunity for these regions to use the fund Uh, yes, I think it could be a good instrument. So, so to me, it's something new. I am new this thing. So, but uh, looking to energy transition, it's quite evident that uh, the local level would be a key uh, node of these new governances. So, of course, investing on region and municipality soon. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions? If not, maybe for Francesco, because it was very interesting, um, apart from the fact of, of trying to put together, you know, like the uh, technology push and the, the, the pull factors together under the same framework. This is something that is absolutely needed also not for the current research, but also in, in, in planning our future um, uh, policy as well, because we're talking a lot about complementarities and about how the different uh, instruments that we have at our disposal at the EU, national, local, regional level should um, um, converge towards, uh, uh, if not um, same uh, results, but at least not damaging uh, each other and the results on the ground. Um, and what I found interesting and maybe further to develop is that because you're showing concrete examples of how the mechanism worked and where it has effects, yeah? Like in the energy field, but you're also showing where it doesn't. And that that should be linked, I think, as a next step in the in the reflection and the development of the of your research, uh, if you ever are envisaging this, but that would be very much welcome for the commission to actually read on that. It would be to see uh, to link the fact where, where it does not have an effect, why it does not have an effect, and then in that case, should cohesion policy go there as it does for the moment? Yeah, because these are areas where it does not work. Uh, uh, I, was, I was baffled. Yeah, so just, just to, to, to go from there and then to go the next mile and to see, uh, okay, 
cohesion policy has invested there for a while. My results show, the data shows that the effect is marginal. Is that a reason to continue investing in that? If yes, why and how to better do it? If not, then maybe concentrate on other type of investments which work better. So that, that is the kind of very concrete examples of applied research that would be um, that would be important to have in the years to come. Can I provide very short answer? Thank you. That's the perfect <laughs> answer. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, actually, um, I presented a slightly shorter version of the paper because of no, time constraints. Long, uh, okay, <laughs> so so for people who want to yeah. read more, you can have yeah. you have his talk on presentation, which goes into so a in, lot more detail. In that version, we disentangle also the impact of just the monthful policy yeah. and with respect to firms which are not uh, mm -hmm. targeted by this policy. Yeah, but that's uh, very important because that's the greening part exactly. of the policy. Exactly. So, <laughs> And in that case, uh, we show that uh, the monthful policy is effective in the manufacturing sector. Um, and we justify that with the fact that this is a sector which is highly characterized by international competition, therefore, the cost transfer mechanism or the carbon leakage mechanism cannot be applied to transfer the extra cost to the final user. And in this case, uh, just the monthful policy is, uh, is effective. And we perform also a um, heterogeneity analysis within subsector of the manufacturing sectors, which are identified also by a report of the European Commission, uh, where we show that effectively when we distinguish across these subsectors, which have different level of cost transfer percentage, um, the result confirmed that where the cost transfer is lower, there is higher um, input into uh, innovation. So um, I thank you for your comment. I think we can go even further, let's say, in uh, justifying this and proposing a mechanism also for the manufacturing sector. This for maybe partially answer your question, but of course, we will try to push further this uh, research mm -hmm. because I think it could be a uh, value added for the because I think that concrete examples of, yeah. of real applied complementarities, it's something yeah. that it's very valuable yeah. and that for the moment is missing. So that would be a real research gap to be uh, to be filled in. Yeah. And where you would have an added value in terms of also um, not only yeah. development of a mechanisms of a theoretical mechanism, but also how to apply it yeah. concretely to the policies. And it's not just cohesion policy because you're going yeah. uh, beyond. Okay, other questions? If not, we can continue our discussion uh, with a coffee and, uh, and a glass of water for those that enjoyed. We were, uh, thank you very much for your attention. We were a very popular um, 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 session. At a certain moment, I thought that I would need to go and find some chairs, but we managed in the end. So um, thank you and uh, see you on the hallway. Yeah, I'm not sure.